Good. So let's start from this. So this is about 100 slides. So we're going to go through about uh, half of it today. So we're going to do the fundamentals today. And uh, we're going to discuss more the, applic the, the applications in, in two weeks from now. So the, um, the outline of the lecture is the following. I will go briefly through uh, an historical introduction to, 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 to the subject. And then we'll discuss a bit uh, what ionizer radiation is. So I do not know the actually the, the background of the people. You know, we can tell you, we know that you come from from different uh, origin, uh, your different level of graduation. So I'll try to be not too simplistic, but not too much advanced either. So I apologize if I say something which is too too low or too high for some of you. But I'll try to be. Uh, a bit sort of an, of, of, of an average. So then we'll see the, what are the effects of ionizing radiation on men in factory. And then later on, the second part of the lecture, we'll probably go in slide into next week, will be the radiological quantity and units, uh, the principle of radiation protection, a little bit more practical part. Uh, what are the means that are used to protect men from ionizing radiation? And also uh, some overview of instrumentation that, that, that are used for, for uh, monitoring ionizing radiation. Now, I think you all know that the discovery of radiation occurred in 1995 when William Rengen uh, discovered the X-rays. Uh, he called them X because of the unknown origin. So only later they found out that actually this uh, unknown radiation at the time was actually produced by uh, electrons, actually in a, in, a, in, a, in a tube that striking a target would produce in what we know is now Bremsstrahlung, that is uh, X-rays, which we call now X-rays. And uh, practically immediately, he realized that he could actually image um, the inner part of the body um, with uh, this uh, novel discover X-rays. So, in fact, only two years after the discovery of X-rays, the first medical use of, uh, of X-rays um, were put at work by, by taking images of the bones uh, of, of, um, of uh, limbs of men. Now, more or less at the same time, um, you know, there was the discovery of the electron that actually explained the origin of, of X-rays by J.J. Thompson, you know, the, and uh, always in the same period, um, it came the discovery of natural radioactivity by Henry Becquerel, and we will hear again his name because now the unit of uh, activity is actually called Becquerel, replacing actually Curie, who was the uh, previous um, unit, um, which is named after, you know, uh, Marie and Pierre Curie, who always in the same year, in the same period was very, very, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, a, a period dense of discoveries. Uh, uh, they discovered the, um, the radioactivity from polonium and, and uranium. It all happened at the end of 1800. <clears throat> and now, uh, now let's have a look at what is ionizing radiation. Um, what is radioactivity uh, and what are the sources of ionizing radiation? So <clears throat> you all know the periodic table of the elements. There are 92 elements uh, in nature, plus a number of others uh, above number 92, which are <clears throat> artificially produced um, by man, essentially either in a nuclear reactor or in with particle accelerator. Now we've gone up to uh, you know, above 100. Uh, they are grouped in, uh, in classes, if you like. They can be solid, they can be liquid, they can be gas. Um, but the number of the um, periodic elements, uh, in, the number of elements in the periodic table is very, very limited. However, they exist in a much uh, wider um, number of uh, versions, if you like, which is called nuclides. So in fact, you know that an element is characterized by its um, atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus, but essentially all of them have a variable number of neutrons in the nucleus. So in fact, you have something like uh, 3,000 nuclides. So these 92 elements come in uh, 3,000 uh, varieties, if you like. And only about 250 of them are stable, so that they are, they are, they are non radioactive. All the others are radioactive. So in fact, these, these stable nuclides, if you see my, my arrow, the, the, I think you should be able to see the arrow. The stable nuclei are those that more or less have an equal number of uh, neutrons and protons for the first part of the periodic uh, table of the elements. And then with the slight access in, 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 in neutrons. But they all sit more or less across the central part 
of this plot where you have on the uh, y-axis the number of newtons in a, in a, in a nucleus and the, on the um, y-axis number of protons. And the uh, nuclides which have an excess of protons with respect to the number of neutrons that would ideally make them stable tend to be radioactive by getting rid of the excess energy by essentially um, converting a proton because there are too many into a neutron and a, a, a positron. So this part of the charter nuclides are actually uh, is actually populated by what are called beta emitters. So you have uh, uh, nuclei which are unstable, we'll see the mechanism in a, in a, in a moment, that will get a, uh, rid of the excess energy and go down to a, to a st uh, stable state by uh, emitting a positron. On the lower part of the chart, the situation is reversed. So you have nuclei which have actually too many neutrons with respect to uh, to 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 protons. So what they do, they actually convert the neutron into a proton to try to approach this region of stability. And the excess energy is released by a, an electron. And the top part of the chart is actually populated by nuclei which are heavy and they tend to um, eliminate the excess energy by a different type of uh, decay, which is actually alpha decay, or in certain cases, by simplification by splitting the nucleus into smaller pieces. Now, there are actually two types of radiation, as we call them, directly ionizing and indirectly ionizing. Um, directly ionizing radiation is radiation which essentially can deliver energy, can transfer energy to matter directly through many small um, Coulomb interaction along the track. And these are the um, fast charge particles. So, uh, particles which carry an electric charge, like electrons, protons, or alpha particles, they can actually directly interact with matter and transfer energy through uh, Coulomb interactions. Indirectly ionizing radiation, as the name says, are radiation that cannot directly transfer energy to matter, but that first need to transfer energy to charged particles, and then and then is this charge, the secondary charged particle that actually interact with matter and cause um, damage in case of uh, of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, human tissue, for instance. So these are essentially um, uh, either um, X-ray or gamma-ray photons or neutrons, which are neutral. So, for instance, if you have a neutron that interacts with the human body, it's not the neutron itself that make a damage. The neutron essentially interacts with the, most likely the hydrogen content of our body. It sets in motion a proton. The proton is a charged particle that can directly ionize matter and then make a damage to, um, to cells, for instance. So the, um, they set in motion charged particles, and this charged particle, they transfer energy and cause damage to matter. So in fact, to summarize, a photon will set in motion an electron, and the electron will interact with matter. The neutron will set in motion a proton, or a recalling nuclei, depends on the, on the case. And this charged particle will actually uh, deposit energy into matter. Now, what is radioactivity? Well, we essentially anticipated. So some of the uh, nuclides, I mean, most of these 3,000 nuclides that populate the chart of nuclides, uh, so several essentially, essentially all of the, um, all of the elements in, in, in nature, they uh, appear um, in the form of various isotopes, and most of these, or nuclides, and most of these are radioactive. Are radioactive because they are, they are unstable, they have too much energy, and the way they, um, they eliminate the energy is by, as we said before, by um, emitting from, from, from the nucleus uh, a, a charged particle or, 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 or a gamma ray um, in order to uh, eliminate the excess energy and get down to a state of um, a stable um, uh, energy level. Now, as I anticipated, the um, the uh, the uh, 
the rate at which this nuclear transmission occurs is called activity, and the E unit is, is the Becquerel. The Becquerel is simply one disintegration per second. So if you have a, a substance with the, an activity one becquerel, that means you have every second on average one disintegration. So the activity is simply the um, uh, the um, the rate at which nuclei disintegrate. Now the old unit, which is I think is still used in some countries, is the Curie. Now the reason why we went from the Curie to the becquerel when with the um, with the introduction of the international system of, of units is because the background is more let's say basic it's just the, the inverse of a second and also because the curie is a very uh, big unit so a 37 giga background which is a huge amount of radioactivity so in mo if you use curie most of the time you have to use uh, subunits like millicuries or microcuries but the uh, in the international system of units the um, the uh, uh, the unit is the backer. And the, and the minus here is because the activity will actually decrease the number of uh, um, uh, nuclides you have in a, in, a, in a certain amount of substance. Now, what um, characterize a radionuclide is the, its half-life. The half-life is essentially the time necessary to, um, for half of the nuclide to decay. So if you take cobalt-60, for instance, which is, um, it is, a, is an isotope cobalt, which is one of the most um, found radionuclide, for instance, in radioactive waste produced in accelerator components, it's a half-life of five years, which is pretty long. So if you have a, a certain amount of uh, cobalt-60 in, in the metallic component, well, it takes five years because, because the radioactivity becomes half. And then you need additional five years to go down still by a factor of five. So our fly can go from milliseconds to billions of years, in fact. And radionuclide can be of natural origin or produced by nuclear reaction, which are called artificial radionuclides. Now, you can imagine that those who are really of natural origin, the date back from the origin of Earth, are very few because there are only those which have a half-life of uh, billions of years, because otherwise they would have decayed. So in fact, mo most of the radionuclides of natural origin are continually reproduced, for instance, by interaction of the uh, uh, cosmic ray with the, with the atmosphere. So you find, for instance, in nature, uh, tritium or beryllium-7. You know, tritium has a, it's a few years of half-life, uh, beryllium-7, 53 days, so they cannot be from the very beginning, but they are continuously produced by uh, reaction from cosmic rays with the with the with the molecules of the atmosphere, or you can actually produce them artificially. Some of them are actually produced artificially for medical application, but this will be discussed uh, at, the, at the at the at the at the lecture in uh, in three weeks from now. So you have certainly heard of alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron radiation. So alpha, it's uh, as we, I anticipate in a few slides, is actually uh, emitted by essentially the heaviest nuclei. An alpha particle is just a, a helium nucleus. It's made of uh, a cluster of two proton and two neutrons. The typical alpha energy for um, radioactive alpha, alpha nuclei is a few MeV. It's, uh, it's not penetrating at all. I mean, it stops in a, in a, in a few millimeters of paper. Uh, so it, it actually does not pose a radiological hazard from uh, external radiation, but it's extremely dangerous if it is inhaled ingested or absorbed through a wound because it causes internal irradiation and local damage to the tissue. A beta particle can be either electrons or positrons, so it's an electron with a charge either positive or negative. Um, when they're emitted, they have an energy which can be as low as a few keV to a maximum of a few MeV. They also have relatively limited penetration, so again, the uh, danger is mostly for the skin and the eyes, but not for the deep organs in the, for, for uh, external radiation. But it is dangerous if it is, again, inhaled, ingested, or absorbed because the internal radiation um, that would cause local damage. Uh, photons are electromagnetic radiation, just as uh, light or, or, or ultraviolet, but of course, they carry much more energy. And uh, the, actually, the difference between um, um, you know, X-rays or gamma rays with respect to um, radio waves, microwaves, uh, visible light, is the amount of 
energy they, they carry. And in fact, it's called ionizing radiation to discriminate this thing from, for instance, UV light or, or, or microwaves because UV light or light or microwave, they cannot ionize radiation, whereas, um, you know, X-rays and, and, and gammas uh, do actually ionize radiation. This is why they make, uh, they make um, uh, the, the, the damage to cells. Again, when they're emitted by, by the excitation of a nucleus, they have an edge that can be as low as few TV to a few MeV. They are very penetrating. So the hazard in this case is given by external radiation. I mean, it doesn't make any difference whether the source is outside or inside of the body, because I mean, a, a cobalt 60 from, uh, so a gamma ray from cobalt 60 will just go through the body. You know, it's a 1.3 MeV gamma ray that will uh, go across uh, your body. So whether it is inhaled, ingested, or just an external um, um, source, it doesn't matter. Uh, neutrons, as we said, are neutral particles. They actually come straight from the uh, um, nucleus of the, of, of the atom. They are very penetrating, they're very difficult to shield. So they mostly um, they actually uh, represent an external radiation hazard. And the difference with respect to, to alpha, sorry, to, to gamma, beta, um, or, or um, uh, X rays is they have an enhanced biological effect. So uh, neutrons, just like alpha particle, they, have, uh, they are much more damaging to tissue than, um, for instance, um, an X-ray photo. Sometimes you have the emission of uh, fragments like protons or ions, which also uh, are essentially, um, uh, can be produced by, you know, when, when, they, when they have the nuclear fragments and that also can have an increased biological effect. So these are particles which are, and then we, we, we see something, we talk about carbon ions when we discuss, uh, you know, uh, hadron therapy in, in, the, in, in, the, in the following lecture. So for instance, some example of, uh, of decays, um, for instance, on the left here, you have uh, sodium-22 decay scheme, which uh, takes 2.6 years, half-life. Um, so the sodium-22 will disintegrate by an emission of uh, gamma rays to, um, they can go straight to a the stable state of uh, neon 22, or uh, it can decay into a metastable state of neon, which will then dis uh, disexcite. Uh, cobalt 6, I mentioned before, the, the, the decays in, in about uh, five years. So the half life is about five years, and emits two gamma rays in cascade of similar energy, 1.17 MeV and 1.33 MeV. So with the, with the gamma spectrometer, you can actually discriminate the two gamma lines. And they and end up on a, on a nickel 60 um, nuclei, which is stable. Uh, beryllium 7, which I also mentioned uh, before, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beta emitter. So it will, it will decay by um, emission of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a beta particle uh, ending up in, in lithium uh, 7. Uh, Sometimes you have a pure beta emitter. So, you know, very often the, the, um, the beta emission leaves the uh, the final nuclei in an excited state, which is then de-excited with an additional emission of radiation like an X-ray or, or a gamma ray. Uh, in the case of tritium, which is the one of the three uh, isotopes uh, in which uh, hydrogen is present in nature, is a pure beta emitter. So tritium will de-excite by emitting um, an electrons and a, a, a neutrino. So you will only see the, 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 the electrons. And again, the energy is something like a few MeV. Now, as I anticipated, the, um, the absorption of, of radiation in matter depends really on the type of radiation. So, and the, the mechanism is different. So alpha and beta particles, when they traverse matter, are degraded in energy. So since they are charged particles, they transfer their energy uh, in collision most again, you know, by Coulomb scattering against the electrons of the medium, and alpha, you know, a heavy, you know, a, for instance, a, a fast proton or a fast carbon ion can also do nuclear reaction. But most of the energy, and especially if you are limited to the alpha and beta particle producing uh, by radioactive sources, they actually slow down um, in matter, so uh, they actually lose energy by collision against the, uh, you know. By essentially transferring energy to the to the um, electron, the medium, so they they lose energy until essentially they stop. Whereas gamma rays, they're actually attenuated. So they, when a gamma ray typically interacts with a mechanism like you know a photoelectron or or, 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 a, or a Compton event, 
and if this event occurs, the gamma is essentially removed from the beam. Otherwise, it keeps going. So the gamma rays, they, they, they survive, if you like, they emerge behind uh, a certain amount of material, like, you know, a shielding. They will still have the same energy, but they will be less intense. So they, they will be, the, the, the intensity of the beam will be reduced, but the energy of the gamma ray will be the same. So in a very qualitative way, you can think that you can, a piece of paper is sufficient to stop uh, alpha particle. So if you have a, a radioactive source emitting alpha particle, you take a piece of paper and that's sufficient to protect your skin from, from the alpha particles. Um, beta particles, they need a few millimeter to a few centimeter of uh, plastic material. So light material is sufficient. You don't need lead to stop alpha particles. Actually, it's even better to use actually light material because uh, um, electrons in heavy material can generate Bremsstrahlung photons. So the typically um, beta sources are actually shielded with plexiglass. <laughs> and a typical few millimeter or a few centimeter of plastic are sufficient to stop them. Gamma rays are much more penetrating. They will penetrate uh, paper, they will penetrate plastic. You need essentially high Z material like lead or steel to stop them. Neutron would need mostly um, material with a high hydrogen content because neutron will mostly interact by um, scattering, either elastic or inelastic scattering with, uh, with the nucleus. So a neutrons of an energy of up to say 10 MeV would preferentially interact with the, the hydrogen content of the material and concrete is the best material for shielding because it contains a lot of hydrogen. It is easy to build in, 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 in blocks and in walls and is uh, one of the less expensive material that you can use actually to build a ship. Um, so how radionuclides are built up and decay? So suppose you have a beam of a particle from a cyclotron because you want to produce radionuclide for a medical application that we will see in the next lecture. Um, so the amount of radionuclide that you can actually produce while shooting a certain beam of protons, for instance, onto a certain target is, of course, the interaction probability, which is called cross-section. I mean, how probable is that a certain nuclear reaction takes place to convert a stable nuclei into an unstable nuclei. Um, but it depends also on the, um, on the flux of the, of the incoming particle. It can be monoenergetic, but it can also be a you know, spectrum of neutrons, for instance, and the limit intensity. And this is the formula. So the number, the, the nuclear production rate is directly proportional, of course, to the intensity of the beam. This gives you the number of target nuclei. So this is the Avogadro number, which is the number of uh, atoms per mole. A is the atomic number of the element, the number of um, uh, grams per mole. A rho is the density. And then you integrate on the uh, fluence of the incoming particle, the cross section, which depends on the energy. And this will give you the, you can, it, it will allow you to calculate how many nuclei of a certain species you can uh, produce by a certain nuclear reaction. We will apply this one at the lecture on medical application uh, in a couple of weeks. Now, you can guess that, I mean, the, the shorter is the half life of the radionuclei, the faster it will build up, but also the faster it will decay. And in fact, the activity of a, of a radionuclide that you are producing by, for instance, bombarding a certain target with the, with the, with the beam of uh, protons depends on the radiation time with this formula. So you will increase by bombarding for a, for a, for a certain time, which we call T radiation, the maximum activity we can reach, which is the activity of saturation, it depends on this formula. And in fact, if uh, this T irradiation is about five times the, this is the, the consider is the, is the half-life. Is, is, um, so if five times the half-life, this, this expression here approaches one. So if this half-life is short, you need a short irradiation time to make this, uh, this uh, term inside the brackets close to one, because this goes quickly to zero. And you will reach the maximum activity you can actually create 
at saturation in a short time. If you want to produce cobalt 60 by radiating, for instance, uh, cobalt 59 with neutrons, why well, it takes 30 years because the cobalt 65 are five times half life, you need to irradiate for five or six uh, half life to reach saturation. The same is valid for the decay because while you are actually producing a radionuclide, this will also decay and will decay with this, uh, with, uh, with this decay time, with this, this half life. So if the half-life is very short, the decay will be very fast. If the half-life is very long, the decay will be very long. So in fact, uh, this plot gives you the buildup and decay of uh, a radionuclide. And it tells you that you want to produce a radionuclide for instance for medical application. Well, you need to radiate uh, long enough to be able to produce uh, a sufficient amount of what you need, taking also into account that the radionuclide is decaying while you're actually bombarding. And when you stop irradiating, you will have produced in a certain amount, given this by AS times the term inside, and then it will start to decay. So it's intuitive to understand that, I mean, the, 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 the buildup and decay depends, of course, on the, on the half-life of the radionuclide. Now, let's go now into dosimetry. So we need units now to define, to start thinking of the um, radiation damage to material in general and to humans in specific. So what counts here is the, is the well, we, we know, I mean, the, uh, when, 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 a material, uh, when, when, when radiation interacts with any material, essentially deposit energy. So the energy deposited by given radiation per unit mass is, is in the SI units is jow over kilogram and it's called absorbed dose and the special name is gray one gray equals to one jow over one kilogram sorry for the mistake the case should be lower case um, this is in SI units if you go to the United States they still talk about rad the rad is one hundredth of a gray one gray is a pretty big unit we'll come to that in a, in a while a few grays of uh, total body radiation is sufficient to kill a man. So one gray of uh, absorbed dose, it is quite a substantial amount of uh, radiation absorbed by, 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 by tissue. Um, radiation protection, in fact, uses an operational quantity, which is called dose equivalent, which takes into account not only the uh, absorbed dose, because um, one gray of absorbed dose by photons or neutrons is one gray of absorbed dose. But the biological effect is different because the nature of the radiation is different. So in radiation protection, we, um, we, we use um, another um, unit, which is called sievert, for the dose equivalent, which is actually the absorbed dose weighted by a quality factor that takes into account um, the essential, the, the, the radiobiological effectiveness of the given radiation while interacting with tissue. So Q has no uh, units, it's just a number, so that the, 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 the sievert uh, is, is still equivalent to a, a joule per kilogram, but remember is actually those weighted by, by this quality factor. So now I have a question. Are we all exposed or not to some radioactive sources? And the answer, of course, is yes. And now, if everything goes well, I will try to show it to you. Um, and I will show it by going to this. So I have a, I hope it works. I have a small detector plugged into my computer, which I actually show when I gave the last lecture, I think in Namibia two years ago, but now I have to do it remotely. So um, this is a, a, a the, 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 the Medikix is a small uh, pixel detector, which is a silicon sensor, essentially typically 300 micron thick, which is, a, it, which is a, uh, connected to a readout, which is a pixelating. So you have uh, um, about in a two square centimeter surface, this is a two square centimeter surface silicon detector, you have um, 65,000 individual bump bonding connecting the silicon to the readout. Um, which makes a pixel detector with 55 micron um, pixel size. So you can actually image over a two square centimeter radiation with a 55 micron um, resolution. 
this is the cellular detector. What I have now plugging my computer is this one. This is uh, the USB light uh, type Medipixel. The Medipixel is actually the, 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 the sensor side, it's two square centimeters, 1.4 times 1.4 square centimeters with the electronics, with the small readout. In this version, everything is on board. And you, the advantage of this, you can actually plug it into the computer with a USB cable. So it's very light, very compact. The uh, principle is the following. When you have uh, uh, radiation interacting with the silicon there, this radiation creates a charge in the sensitive volume, no? create charge, which is actually collected by the electrodes. Um, the charge here is amplified and the uh, signal is compared to a threshold. And if the signal exceeds the threshold, it gives a count. It is actually counted. So charge deposited here, is converted into an electrical signal in, 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 in the amplifier, this blue box that you saw attached to the, to, to the sensor. It's compared to, the, to, a, to a comparator, to a threshold, and if the signal exceeds the threshold, um, you have a count. The advantage with this type of detectors um, is that it's essentially noise-free. So you can set the threshold so to cut all the noise and every signal is a real one. Now, this time piece is very interesting because they actually can work in three different modes. One is the one I just explained, which is just uh, counting uh, particles. One is the one we try to use. Uh, I hope it works because, I mean, I tried a few times before, before the lecture. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so the, 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 the time of a threshold mode is actually a mode in which you can actually um, measure the deposit energy. So when you get a signal, the signal is converting to, into, uh, I mean, the, 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 the part interacting with the silicon. The, the charges are then amplified and shaped into, into, a, into a, a voltage signal, which is compared to, the, to a threshold. And then the number of counts are given by a clock, which is intrinsic with the, with the, with the electronics, which depends on the amplitude of the signal. So the longer the signal stays above threshold, the, the larger is the number of count that you see here, and the other way around. So this tells you that the, um, the, 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 the counts you get here is proportional to the energy deposit. So if you, you can calibrate the detector so that you can actually have uh, um, an indication of the, um, of the uh, energy deposited. And if this device works, we will see some cosmic rays. And then I will put on the device this small disk, which I got together with the, with the detector, which is a, a very small piece of uh, glass, but which contain um, a little bit of uranium-238. Uranium-238 is part of the um, natural decay chain of uranium, so you have some uh, alpha and beta particles emitted by the small disk. So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to, um, you still see my, my screen, I think? Yes, we see it. Yeah, you see that? So I have to minimize all this thing, which I don't need. And this is the uh, interface of the, of, the, of the time picks. So I already set it up, and if I sprint, okay, this gives some uh, noise uh, in the beginning. And then you should start uh, counting. So what you should be able to try that. Now I let it run. Oh, we, we, we go back, so I'm, you know, this thing is plugged into my computer. Now, let, let it count for, a, for, for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and let's go back to the, to the, to, to the lecture. And we go back to that <clears throat> in a moment. So, um, no. right. So, the answer, of course, is yes. So, what are the natural radiation levels? We will, have an, we will see something in, a, in, in 10 minutes. But essentially, we are all exposed to natural radioactivity. This is just the, the, the annual dose received in France. It depends on the country. It depends whether you have more mountains, whether the, what is the average altitude on, on, the, on the sea level, a um, number of things. But essentially, you have various components. One is the one coming from the earth. So the, the material with which our houses are constructed or the, the, the soil in which we will, will, will walk on, contains uh, minerals, which include some um, radioactive nuclides. So about half a millisiever is given by essentially radiation hidden in Earth. About 0.3 millisiever come from space, the one we're gonna measure now with the, with the, with the, with the Medipix. 
Some are actually ingested by food because uh, you know, everything contains, and remember there are 92 natural elements, there are 3,000 nuclides, and most of them are radioactive. So any, any, any piece of food will contain some uh, radioactive elements. Medical exposure, that depends um, I know, how many medical examinations you have. So this is a very variable with, 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 with people. This point eight is just the average for, for the population in France. Very little come from uh, um, the nuclear industry. So France which has a lot of uh, power station, but uh, they contribute very little to the population dose. But the most one come from radon. Radon is a radioactive gas that it's inside one of the um, uh, the uh, one of the three uh, decay chains of the natural, uh, um, you know radionuclide that are there since the origin of Earth. And this accounts for about half of what we all get in terms of uh, <clears throat> radioactivity. And radon is there. So this is the periodic table of the elements we saw before. Radon is a, is a, a radioactive gas, is a noble one, so it interacts very little. And in fact, it's not the radon itself, which is, um, which is, uh, which is actually giving dose to us. Radon is, is part of the decay chain of uranium-238, this tiny amount of uh, stuff that I have in this small glass that I've showed you before. So it, it's, it's here, radon-226, but the point is that two, for, uh, the, the two of the radionuclides that come after radon in the chain are polonium, polonium-218 and polonium-214, and these are alpha particle emitters. So these emit alpha particles, and as, as I said in one of the early slides, if a polonium is ingested then or inhaled then the alpha particle that are produced in the disintegration of these two radionuclides will deposit energy locally and since radon is a gas what happens the radon attaches to particulate and then can be actually be breathed by normal breathing and will will end up in the lungs it will attach in the lung and this is the damage which is actually given by the polonium. This is something that we all have. The distribution of radon on Earth is extremely disomogeneous. There are regions like in Switzerland, there are certain regions of Switzerland, not where I live, not the uh, Geneva area, but the, some of the other regions of Switzerland where they have a lot of radon. So you see, most of the country have a low level. The unit is back up a cubic meter. So I would say until 50 back up a cubic meter is not much. When you start having two, three hundred mega per cubic meter, then you should consider ways of reducing the radon exposure. Which sometimes, I mean, radon is essentially a problem indoor, so in you know enclosed spaces. So typically, you find it in cellars. But if you have uh, construction material which uh, which is uh, rich in um, in, uh, for instance, uranium two three eight, then you will have the radon uh, emanating from the from the walls or emanating from the from the basement. And then you might have uh, radon accumulating in, in, in a room. And one of the easiest solutions is to open a window and just ventilate for a few minutes. That, 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 that's, that's very simple. But radon is not the only um, radon high which is present. We have, uh, so we, we saw in the, in the, in the, when the earth was created in the, in the crust, there will be, there were a number of uh, long lived, you know, uh, billions of years of life, radon nuclide, uranium and thorium essentially, but also potassium-40, which is still also present in our bones. Uh, and these are the, the really original ones, the ones that are there from the very beginning. But then you also have another an, 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 a number which are continuously reproduced. Um, cosmogenic nuclides anticipated are those produced by the interaction of the cosmic rays with the, the atmosphere. So you have uh, uh, a shower of, uh, you have cosmic rays coming from the outer space, they interact with the atmosphere, they, they produce secondary particles, and they do nuclear reactions. And they produce, for instance, carbon-14, they produce tritium, which is 12 years um, half-life, they produce beryllium-7, and you find this, so we call them, say, natural radionuclide, but are, say, cosmogenic. They're actually continued produced by interacting with, with, the, with the atmosphere. Now, let's go back and have a look if the detector has counted anything. You see, you see the, um, the slide? So these are the interaction of um, um, cosmic rays in this two square centimeter silicon detector <clears throat> since we started, since I started. Now, if I take my small uranium glass and I put it on top, you should see something more. Sorry, I think I stopped. So, oh no, sorry, I, I, it has stopped because I put the, 
thousand. Uh, so I start it again. I start it again. See if it works. Yeah. You see, I put the glass now. You see how fast it goes. Mm -hmm. So these are curly tracks are electrons, in fact. So this is not cosmic rays. Cosmic ray, you know, they build up at a much lower rate. You know, so we, we saw we, we showed a few tracks in in about you know what was that 50, 10, 10, 10 minutes. These are actually electron tracks left by the um, um, small amount of uh, natural radioactivity which is in the glass. So you can actually image radiation with this small device. Um, there are a number of radium clouds in our body. So we all have about eight kilo becquerel, 8,000 becquerel of radioactivity inside us. Most of it is potassium 40, carbon 14, and then a few becquerel of, of, of the other. Now you, you probably have heard of this carbon 14 dating. So carbon 14, we said is about 5,000 something years of life. And it's in an equilibrium with the stable carbon, with, with carbon 12. So all of the living organism have um, carbon. You know, the carbon is part of our, of our body. When an organism dies, the relation between the two carbon changes because carbon 12 remains as it was at the moment the, um, you know, the, 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 the organism died and carbon 14 start to decay. So um, archaeologists can go back, uh, and paleontologists can go back and try to date um, the, 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 um, uh, the age of, of a fossil, of an of organism who, who died long ago, by looking at the ratio between the carbon 14 and carbon 12, because, because this ratio changes uh, with time after the, the, uh, the organism has died. Uh, the exposure to which we are all um, subject is also much affected by altitude. So, as I showed before, at um, at ground level, we have um, about uh, three, four hundred microsievert contribution per year from cosmic rays. Um, so, in the Geneva region, which is uh, about uh, three hundred eighty meters above, uh, five hundred meters above sea level. The natural background radiation, which is a emission of the cosmic as, as the terrestrial, is 0.1 microsievert per hour. So, in fact, I mean, at CERN, we have a personal dosimeter, which is a, a semi active one, and the system automatically subtracts when you read the dosimeter two microsieverts per day, because that's the natural background that we all receive living in Geneva at CERN as well by the natural background, cosmic and terrestrial. But if you go up, then increases a lot. And if you go to uh, flight level, so between 10 and 12, 13 kilometers, which is the, um, the average flying altitude of uh, commercial aircraft, the dose rate varies between uh, 2.5 and 5 microsieverts per hour. It depends on the altitude, between 10 and 13 kilometers, it changes quite a lot. It depends on the route, because if you go close to the poles, uh, you have less geomagnetic shield, you have a higher dose rate. If you're close to the equator, you are less uh, better shielded by the, uh, by the Earth magnetic field. But you have to consider when you fly, when you are at flying altitude, so if you fly from uh, Europe to the US, for instance, or from Europe to, uh, to South Africa, um, the time you spend in altitude, you get between two and a half and five microsieverts per hour, which is say, 50 times more than what you get when you stay with your feet on the ground. And of course, the astronauts on board the ISS, they get much more. Huh? They, you know, the typical integral dose is a couple of tens of microsieverts per hour. So they usually get uh, three, 400, 500 microsieverts per day of uh, exposure. Now let's compare doses. So the daily natural background radiation, as we said, according to where you are, I mean, in the Geneva region is two, three microsieverts per hour. Is, is, apart from exception, is about this one. If you take the terrestrial and the, and the, and the Okay, in Brazil, there are some beaches where the uh, sand will contain um, a much more radioactive minerals, so they have a much higher dose rate, but it's a bit of an exception. Um, but let's take a two, three microsieverts per hour as a sort of a natural background radiation, which will build up to about a millisievert per year. And then if you look at what I gave you before, the, 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 the average exposure we all 
receive is between two and three, depends. I mean, if you live in an area where there is more radon, uh, whether you get some uh, radiography, you know, or medical exposure, but otherwise is, is, is this one. A chest X-ray will give you 10 microsieverts. So now, you know, X-ray technology have, have, um, have much improved. So if you just do a chest X-ray, it's only 10 microsieverts. Now here we're talking about whole body exposure. Huh? There is a big difference between, you know, getting, you know, one microsiever on, or say one siever on a finger or one siever total body. Here we're talking about whole body exposure. When you go and get a chest X-ray, of course, with most of the dose is within the chest where the imager is, but you get scattered radiation. So it's 10 microsiever. And then you go up. Air crew, people actually um, working on planes, like, you know, um, cabin crew, pilots, frequent flyer. Some frequent flyers, they fly as much as, uh, as, as, as pilots. The average exposure about three millisiever. I'm talking about above the natural exposure because you have to consider that they fly about a thousand hours per year. You take, you know, people, you know, air crew, um, uh, you know, working on long haul flights. They, they, you know, they spend one flight, they maybe have two, three days to recover. Maybe they fly two, four flights per, per, per week. So you have to count about a thousand, thousand hours per year at about three, four microsieverts per hour. It's about three, 3,000 millisieverts. A CT scan will give you 10 millisieverts. So a CT scan start giving you some substantial, again, we're talking about small doses, but it's something you can, it is measurable. So a CT scan will give you 10 millisieverts, which will be way above your average exposure. The maximum annual dose allowed by limits, we will discuss this in the next, uh, you know, next week, the second part of this lecture, is about 20 millisievert. Next week we'll discuss, you know, um, the, the principle of uh, justification of exposure, optimization, limits, but you have to think that the radiation worker, either you work at CERN, in a power station, in a hospital, whatever you want, a pilot, you must not exceed an annual exposure of 20 millisievert. Why 20 millisievert? Because the risk factor we're going to discuss um, later on, 20 millisievert will give you a negligible risk for a long-term risk, um, essentially um, development of a cancer. And it is well below any limit for developing, uh, you know, immediate effects. So 20 millisievert, even if you're taking a single shot, will not give you any um, health effect and it will not give you any long-term um, um, uh, consequences. Above this 20, exposure must be justified. It could be that you have to give somebody 50 millisieverts in a shot. I mean, if you have a, a radiological accident, uh, you know, like, you know, Chernobyl or, or Fukushima or what has happened, sometimes you have to send in people um, because, you know, to rescue maybe um, workers that were there, they, they, they cannot, you know, they've been wounded, maybe you have to re recover people, you have to maybe secure some situation. So in, in, in a planned circumstance, you can actually expose people to more than the 20 millisievert and up to 100 millisievert, this is still considered a low dose. Above 100 millisievert, you start going into uh, the domain of uh, doses where effects may not be completely negligible. And at, the, at this point, the dose rate also become uh, important because if you get one siever in a single shot or one siever over a lifetime, it is different. One siever in a single shot may induce um, detectable symptoms like vomiting, for instance. If you integrate one siever over one year, you're only left with a few percent excess cancer risk, but you're not going to get any immediate effect. And the lethal dose for men is between five and 10 siever, all body exposure. So if somebody gets in a single shot, five siever, you have about 50% chance of dying. When you do radiation therapy to a patient, they get a much higher dose. They get two siever per fraction over several weeks, but this dose is given not total body, it's given to a very, very small amount of the body. It's given only to the tumor site. So remember, all body dose or those given to a single organ, are, they do not have the same effect. And if I, I don't know if somebody of you remembers, maybe Keteva remember many years ago, there was this um, case of this Russian spy that was killed in, in England 
It was poisoned by uh, polonium-210, one of the polonium isotopes. It was discovered that it was actually poisoned with the radioactive polonium, and the post-mortem examination the study showed that they, they got 18 silver, which is a lethal dose. There's no way you can survive with 18 silver. So just to give you, so I've been, when you get around one siever, it's becoming, you know, a bit up to the limit. The interesting thing, in, when the, if you go back about 100 years, uh, you know, a few years after, you know, in the, in the 20s, more or less, so 20 years after they discovered the radioactivity, and when, you know, they started to dig out radioactive substances, it was thought that the radiation was good. So there were actually um, products rich in radiation. Because they thought the radiation was good for the for the for the um, for the for the for the human health, and e essentially, it was realized that it was not the case when they started to detect a substantial number of cases of radiation sickness. And one of the most famous cases was this uh, workers in the in the U.S. in uh, in a um, in a watch factory. They were actually these ladies were actually painting. The, uh, the 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 quadrant of the watch with the uh, fluorescent uh, paint, which was rich rich on radium, because we were making the uh, the, the the watch uh, visible at night. But the point they were actually licking the uh, the tip of the paint of the of the of the, of the paint, and they got radiation poison. And they and once a number of them died, it was I mean that was one of the cases in which it was really realized that radiation can be really dangerous. So again, don't be scared. Small exposure like the one we are all exposed is part of life, but uh, chronic and uh, acute exposure may be activity. So these were products that were actually on the market 100 years ago until it was realized it was, it was not that good. Now, I wanted to close this part of the lecture with uh, looking at the effects of how radiation actually uh, interacts, I mean, how it makes damage to the, to the human body. Um, and then we're gonna see next week a bit more the 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 the, 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 the application. So why is radiation dosimetry important? Because of the fact of the interaction of radiation with the matter. So this is why we have radiation dosimetry. So all biological systems are susceptible to damage by ionized radiation, and the basic rule is the the more complex is the organism, the the easier it is to damage it. So the dose you need to damage a bacterium it thousands of, 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 of grays. With man, we said four gray, which is, which, is, which is amount, which is a tiny amount of energy because a whole body dose of four gray will only raise your body temperature by 0 0.001 degree. So nothing, you, ca you, you cannot measure it, but it could kill you. So four gray is a substantial amount of energy but it would do nothing to a bacterium because the bacteria is very too simple. We need a much higher amount of radiation to damage a simple organism. And this is why radiation damages organism. Well, we, 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 we said that in the, in the early slides because in fact, the radiation imparts energy to atoms and molecules. So what you do, you perturb the atomic and molecular bonds, essentially. So, um, and there are two effects, in fact. You can either, you know, radiation can, you know, absorb energy released by radiation, can either kill the cell directly, because you damage the, the, for instance, the molecular bonds, or it may form reactive species, which are called free radicals, which are toxins for the cell. And then it's a sort of an in, indirect um, uh, damage. And the main of the dosimetry, as the name says, is the measurements of the absorbed dose in order to be able to, for instance, protect men against the harmful effect. So as we said, you have a primary particle track, we can actually damage directly the DNA. I mean, the, 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 the most damage is always to the DNA, to the DNA of, of, of the cell. If you, have, if you cause a single strand break, the damage can be repaired. If you produce a double strand break, so you, if you break the double strand at the same time, the damage is irreparable. And neutrons, for instance, are much more capable of producing double strand break than photons. That is why they have a higher biological effect. Um, 
the uh, one of the way i mean to to um, discriminate the, um, the the type of damage you, the aeration can do is by the what is called the ray biological effectiveness and essentially is this you see on the on, on this plot you take a number of cells a colony of cells and you radiate them with a different dose of different radiation then you after that you measure the survival i mean what fraction has survived 10 percent one percent one per million now x-rays the survival curve for acceleration is this one. If you take a carbon ion, for instance, the survival curve will be this one. If you take the ratio of the doses that you need to reach, say, 10% survival, so to kill 90% of the cells, the dose of X-rays over the dose to the radiation you, you are investigating is the RB. In other terms, a carbon ion would be more effective in killing cells because it's, it's an IRB with respect to X-rays because you need way less dose to reach the same um, effect to inactivate 90% of the cells. And if you see from the third curve, the situation, the, I mean, the RB is a very, very complex uh, quantity. It depends not only on the radiation, it depends on where you are on the survival curve. I mean, the RB, if you calculate it here, here and there is not the same. It depends on the dose rate, but this is just to give you a, you know, just a snapshot. So what are the effects of radiation? Well, there are two types of effects which I already anticipated and I'm nearly done with the lecture today. Stochastic and deterministic. So a stochastic effect, as the name says, is a probabilistic effect. There is no dose threshold, but there is a big debate on this, whether there is a threshold, there is not, but we assume that there is no threshold and the stochastic effect is the linear function of those. And these effects are long-term effect, is a genetic effects. We can cause, you know, genetic, be transmitted to the, to your, you know, to the, to the, to the, you know, the, 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 the son, the daughters, or can be cancer that will kill the, kill the person or the organism. Um, so it's a delay at detriment. And as I said, for men, you have to consider about 5% per sievert of long-term defect. This is why I'm saying the limit, the annual limit of exposure for work is 20 millisievert. Because even if you integrate over a lifetime and you never do it, because in fact, radiation workers stay well below 20 millisievert per year. Maybe, you know, at CERN, we, we have a very few people who get maybe more than one millisievert per, per year. But even if you get 20, and you multiply for, for the lifetime career with 35 years, it will still be sort of a, of the order of the percent of excess cancer risk, which is essentially comparable to, which is low with respect to um, the natural occurrence of cancer, and is comparable to the risk you incur in any other occupation. These are the stochastic effects. The thermistic effects are essentially effects that are visible if the dose is received in a short time interval, and it has a threshold. And this is why we keep 20 millisievert because 20 millisievert, it's way below any threshold for any deterministic effect. For instance, if you get you know, a sievert to the skin, well, you get a radiation burn. If you get a, skin, a, a sievert whole body, you get vomiting. You might have uh, you know, um, immune deficiency. If you get you know, a sievert to the, to the eye, you get cataract, cataract. And the lethal dose sits about, as I said, five silver. And I'll, uh, one of the last slides today is just a bit more on that. So we said you have two ways you can cause this effect. One is the direct, so direct the ionization, excitation of the biomolecule. You have the time scale here. This occurs in very, this is a physical level, it's very, very short. Or you have indirect effect, so the, the molecule will, will generate. Uh, free radicals. Then the chemistry part comes in. Either a free radical or the direct ionization damage, they would produce some lesions at the DNA, DNA, either directly because of direct interaction radiation or because of the interaction of the free radical would produce um, by biochemistry processes uh, damage. And then you can have three um, 
options, if you like. One is repair. This, you know, most of the damage is actually repair. You know, the, you know, the organism has a fantastic capacity to repair damage. Most of the damage which is done, it is repair. So the thermal, the cell survive, finished. So there's no effect, neither the medicine nor stochastic. What may happen, that there is no repair. So there is an, it can be an uncontrolled cell death, necrosis of the, of the um, if there are a number, lots of cells, so if there's just one cell which is, which is died, doesn't matter, but if you have a, a, a substantial amount of radiation interacting in a single tissue or organ, you might have an uncontrolled cell death over a, a big number of cells in a certain organ, and you can have then a pathology. You can say you can have a cataract in the eye. What can happen, you can have a missed repair. So there's other repair, no repair, or you can repair it, but making a mistake. So the DNA can make a mistake. Well, you could have uh, a non-lethal mutation, or what sometimes happens, the cell is programmed to kill itself to avoid further problems. So if they misrepair, very often the, the, care, the, the cell um, commits suicide. So it disappears, finished. But you can also have a non-lethal mutation because the mutation is lethal. Well, they will, okay, this, the cell is gone, but it could cause a mutation which is not lethal, but we can generate later on either a cancer or hereditary effects that will be transmitted later on. So, and this, you know, the, the time scale go from, uh, you know, time to amount of 16, the first, the, the first um, step here, to years in the case of cancer induction or generation in case of, uh, of hereditary effects. Um, so this is exactly the same which, which I which I explained. Um, so as I said before, I mean the uh, lethal dose for viral organism changes a lot with the complexity. So strange enough, you know, you know, <laughs> goats and, men, and men pigs have, are even more sensitive than men. But essentially, you know, the, you know, the upper organism, I mean, the, the evolved one, you need only a few grades whole body dose to actually kill it. Whereas if you go down to very, very simple organism, you get, you need thousands of grades. And this is why to sterilize medical equipment or food, you need typically 25,000 grades to be able to fully sterilize a, a material because you kill all the pathogens. And this is my last slide for today. Um, what happens with this um, acute irradiation to humans? Well, as I said, the, the the dose which, uh, which risk to be lethal is about uh, five grade and because the damage there is the bone marrow. So in fact, what happens if this is also sometime using in therapy for leukemia, for instance, you want to do the full transport of the bone, bone marrow. So what you do, you, you destroy the bone marrow by giving a, a high dose all body to the patient, but you give it in, in a controlled way and the patient is immediately taken into a sterile, sterile room, protected from any, from any, from any um, infection, and then is given a new bone marrow. If somebody gets an exposure of this sort, um, not planned, and the person is not taken to hospital immediately for a bone marrow transplant, then essentially the time the bone marrow is depleted, is typically months, um, well, then there's nothing else to be done. A, an exposure above five gray is very often lethal because you may damage to intestine and the lungs. And then typically in 10, 20 days, you're done. A, an acute exposure above 15 gray will just give um, an effect on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the nervous system. So for today, I will start there because I mean, the slides are on the, um, I put all the slides on the, on the, on the indicator. We'll also put for the next week. Next week, we go in the second half of the lecture, we go more in the practical part. So this was more, they said the theoretical part would be the quantities. Uh, we see a bit more in practice what is operational radiation protection, uh, the various quantity we use uh, also for instrumentation and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and what we do to protect men. But for today, I stop there. I think uh, I'm more or less on time. And yes, uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Marco. Um, Christine is uh, connected. She's going to lead the discussion session. Okay, let me just go back to Zoom. Somehow. So, hello, Marco, everybody. Hey, Christine, how are you doing? Hello, fine. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. 
So apparently it's radioactive here. This is what you mean in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on the country. Huh? Some okay. countries have, uh, <laughs> have more than others. Yeah. So very good. So do we have any question? I didn't see any written question, but any, I mean, any student would like to ask question to this very comprehensible talk. I think it's good to have it also recorded. I guess you can uh, better understand as well and digest uh, everything. So I stop sharing the screen so I can see you all. Yeah. I don't think you need my slides, but the slides are on Indica anyhow, so you have them, you have them. So I, I put all the, the, the second part of next week is a single, is a single lecture. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of slides as well. So if uh, you don't have question now as well, so this is uh, not a big problem, but uh, any persons that they're asking you can also ask a question next week I mean, because next Thursday we do the second part. So if you have any, if in this week you have, you know, you, you can think over and, uh, and you can ask questions next week as well. Is any person curious? Because one of the things I was still curious that for the case of uh, the, the worldwide uh, radon risk that you were showing, so there's yeah. not much data in with for Africa. Somehow, yeah. probably no, probably not. No, it, de it depends. It really, de I mean, also, I mean, it takes with some, which is a small country here in the Geneva region. There's nothing, but if you go to Tessin or if you go to the Canton, which is close to the Jura, they have much more. I mean, in Tessin, they have uh, um, building with six, seven hundred backup per gram which, with per, per, per cubic meter, which is huge. Yeah, um, Africa, I don't think there is much in general. One of the points, because I remember in Namibia, there was, uh, there is a lot of uranium, for instance. Um, so it means that there are a lot of uh, people who should as well have those information. So yeah. because remember, the radon is a, is a problem indoor. So out, outdoor, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gas. It really accumulates in um, closed spaces. So it also depends on the uh, construction material of the walls of your house. Mm -hmm. If you have a wooden, you know, wall buff. I mean, you don't let, you know, uranium content there. Uh, then uh, for, you, you will speak next week as well about the case for instance of accelerator, like what you had described with the LHC. So, uh, what, sorry? so because we have, it's within two weeks. So could we think about maybe make as well our students thinking about some question like, uh, uh, in the case of an accelerator, so to give some idea about uh, uh, for the LHC, so this is proton turning as well. So which order of magnitude, for instance, do you think that we would have of doses? Yeah, so next week, so the second part of this lecture is, is more radiation protection. So essentially, um, I say the, the um, you know, the three principle that you apply radiation protection. Uh, a bit more on the um, uh, practical implementation or the protection mean that you use um, in, in general. Uh, the other lecture is more like on a, uh, a set of for medicine. For medicine. The radiation protection is mostly this, this one. I mean, it depends on the interest, of course, because by, we work in remote, so we are not limited to June, July. But I mean, sure. uh, um, if somebody is interested for instance, it's more like, you know, uh, shielding aspects, I could, uh, you know, give a lecture on, you know, more dedicated to what you do if you want to shield, for instance, a medical accelerator, mm -hmm. you know. So there are some questions on the, on the chat. No, sorry. Yeah, yes. Uh, so the, so indeed, so there is a first question. So from, uh, uh, so which one? No record of radon and exposure in Africa. Okay. Ah. So what is the, the annual uh, average dose? So this is a question uh, uh, raised by uh, a body. The annual average dose, so where? What is an average? What is? The average dose, this is the sum ah, of- The annual average dose. Um, well, it depends where. So as I said, I mean, for instance, is it, I, I didn't put, uh, because in fact, the slide that I show for France, I have the similar one. I didn't put, I could actually add it and re-upload the presentation. There is one similar for Switzerland. And you see the difference is purely radon. So in France, the average um, exposure of the individual is 2.4 millisievert. Mm -hmm. 
remember this is just the average because you know terrestrial depends where you live uh, the cosmic depends if you live a sea level or 2000 meters but the big vari radon depends where you are the big variation is given by the um, uh, medical exposure you've seen huh? i mean if you take one ct scan it's 10 millisievert so you will have much more than 2.4. So this 2.4 is, 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 is an average. For Switzerland, the average is more like 3.5, and the difference is the radon, because Switzerland has much more radon than, than France, for instance. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the average uh, annual dose really depends uh, where you live. As I said, I mean, there, is a, there is a place in Brazil where they have uh, sand on beaches, which is much richer than... Uh, than anything else in uh, in um, in, uh, in in radioactive uh, nuclides, but I would say I mean typically worldwide is it goes from you know two millisievert to maybe you know it could be four or five except uh, except you know so now people living in, in La Paz in Bolivia, which is, I think is two point seven kilometers altitude, of course they get a much higher the cosmic uh, so probably the cosmic they get is about two or three times more than what we get in Geneva. Geneva is about uh, three, four hundred microsievert. I guess uh, if you live at 2.5 kilometer altitude, you get uh, maybe one, one half millisievert just for that. Oh. And again, we are talking about small doses. It's natural variation of background. It's not that because you live at two kilometers, you, you have a higher uh, risk of developing cancer than that, that me who lives in Geneva. I mean, we're really talking, you know, below 100 millisievert, is still considered low doses. Oh, the low dose. Okay, very good. Uh, indeed, the next question is regarding uh, the, the radon, indeed. And I was mentioning, indeed, there are some mines for the uranium. The, I mean, Africa is very well known for all those other type uh, of uh, mineral that could as well be a potential issue. Of, so of course, I mean, uh, radon in mines, it, it's a lot. Eh? So, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, uh, miners are exposed, uh, but not necessarily just ura uranium mines. I mean, also mines, uh, you know, if you are underground, there is a lot of rock. Rock uh, contains a little bit of, uh, uh, of uranium anyhow. So you have much more I mean, radon in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in mines than anywhere else. I mean, a place where there is a lot of radon is in Rome, in the underground Christian catacombs. Yeah. Because they are very much uh, closed spaces, eh? mm -hmm. and is uh, this um, rock which is called tufo in Italian, which contains a lot of um, um, uranium as a, as, a, as a mineral. Okay, so that's interesting to know. <laughs> so, so it's an unventilated area, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the air. Mm -hmm. So then we have a question uh, from Saed who asks, uh, so is there any process, uh, so chemical or, or whichever that could alter the half-life of the, the radionuclide according to how we want it? <laughs> That's called nuclear <laughs> transmutation. <laughs> well, no, the only way to is to <laughs> actually is, is, is the way that you can actually try to reduce um, long-live uh, nuclear waste from power station is one of the concept is to bombard with you know one two GV protons um, um, long live waste to to essentially via nuclear reaction transform into a, a different radionuclide which is shorter shorter lived. You cannot actually change the half life of that specific nuclide. You can convert the nuclide by by a nuclear reaction into a different nuclide, which is a different half-life, but it might also have a different uh, emission. Mm. Is one is is one of the the, 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 the way to under you know understudy to to shorten the 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 the, the half-life of uh, long-lived waste. It can be you know hundred thousand of years down to maybe a thousand of years. Okay, very good. So then, uh, if you don't mind to look at uh, the slide uh, 31, so we had a... Uh, 31, I can pull it up again. So let me just reshare the screen. Uh, to explain a bit more about the RBE. 31. This one? Yes. The duration damage? Uh, the one with the R. Yeah, be this one, I think. Eh? Yes. Yeah, the most one, you're yeah, right. yeah, this was this was a, yeah, this was a bit complicated, I know. Yeah. 
So DRB is actually a very complex thing. I mean, I'm a physicist, I'm not a radar biologist, so I'm not gonna go into too many details, but the, the RB depends on many things, but essentially it tells you how much a radiation with respect to a reference one, which is typical the 400 kV X-rays, which are there, it's able to induce damage. And for this, you say you take a population, you take a cell count, you take you know a million of cells of uh, anything, huh? and then you you irradiate them. You irradiate them with uh, with different doses, or we, we you irradiate with 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 a certain dose. And then after irradiation, you count the cells, and you see how many are left. There are ten percent left. There's one percent left. There's you no know, one per mil left. The none left. And then if you do this several times, you build a curve. You build a curve that tells you, for instance, the dose needed to kill a certain fraction of the population. So for instance, you need a certain dose. This is the x-axis is the dose. This is the survival of the cell. So a certain, you need a certain x-ray dose, I don't know, 10 gray, to reduce the survival to 10%. That means that only when you count the cells, of the 10% survive. You need uh, maybe um, more dose to, to, to reduce the survival. But take this one, huh? 10%. Then you do the same thing with a different radiation. For instance, carbon ion you want to use in particle therapy. We'll discuss this in the, in the, in the, the, the second series of lecture. And you see that you have a certain dose you do carbon ions. It is not the same. So you need to reach the same effect, less dose from carbon ion than from X-rays. <clears throat> you take this ratio, so for this, this one is a factor of three. Huh? So if it is for this, for instance, this, this will be 30 gray, it will be 10 gray, you know, 10, 20, 30. So the ratio between the 30 gray from X-rays and the 10 gray from carbon ion that are needed to reach the same effect is the RB of carbon ion in respect to uh, X-rays. RB equal three means that your radiation that you're investigating is three times, if you like, more effective in inducing a certain damage <clears throat> with respect to X-rays. The reference <clears throat> radiation is normally X-rays of 400 kV. X-rays of 400 kV are called low LT radiation. You know, one MeV photon from cobalt 60 is not substantially different, would be still be RB equal one. But if you take alpha particles, if you take neutrons, if you take carbon ions, typically they have a much higher capability to damage tissue. And this is why the RB is higher. <clears throat> and if you, if you look at the shape of the, the curves, if I do the same comparison, by sitting, for instance, at 1%. So if I would draw here the same, essentially the distance between this the curve, it's linked to the RB, the distance changes. If I go to, an a, for instance, for 50%, you know, the distance is not the same, so the RB will be different. So the RB is a very complex, um, uh, is a very complex quantity that depends <clears throat> on the cell survival you're evaluating. Let's say it's 50%, 10%, 1%. Depends on the radiation. It does not appear. It depends on the dose rate. Are you giving the same dose in a single shot? Are you giving this 10 grays or 30 grays in a single shot, or are you giving this 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 uh, amount of dose in two, three, four, five steps? So it's a very complicated, but it essentially tells you how much a radiation is more or less effective in causing damage as compared to X-rays. I don't know if it's clear enough. Very good. I think it was uh, really clear. Huh? Uh, so then there was a comment so by uh, Ademo who would like to have notes as well for the shielding and calculation as to well, more or less of the shielding for different design of bunker, especially you want to apply this to medical accelerator of kilovolt X-ray machine. So we can find, I think, some uh, information for him. Huh? I mean, I can, at least for the proton, I can try to, to as well provide some of the shielding calculation maybe you would know some of them, Marco? So I'm um, looking at, ah, I want to know the shielding and bunker design. Okay. Well, uh, what I can do, um, I can send, 
I have uh, actually um, some lectures on this because um, I can either give you some textbooks mm -hmm. uh, or I have um, uh, a lecture that I was giving in the past course on um, shielding. So if you, if you are interested on the, um, you are interested in the um, electron Linux huh, for, for radiation therapy. Really? Yeah, that I can send it to you. If you send me an email, I can send you the PDF. I can extract maybe the slides dedicated to the, to the shielding design and send it to you. And maybe an example that might be good. Yeah, yeah, I have some. <laughs> I also have for, um, for proton machines. We have um, some examples that the design we did for Canal, for instance, but. Um, okay. So you can find uh, Marco's uh, email on uh, the Endigo agenda page. So his email address is in there. Yeah. Okay, very good. And if then you send we me the have... email, I will send it to you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we have, uh, so the next two questions, so one is about to make sure to understand the direct and indirect utilization yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, you essentially, <clears throat> how do you do um, damage to, um, to, to, to matter in general is to perturb the um, electronic structure of the atoms. So the radiation which can directly interact with the, say, the electrical charge of the medium, essentially with the electrons of the medium, are called directly ionizing. <clears throat> and these are the radiation which brings a charge. That is electrons, protons, alpha particles, carbon ions. So those particles that can directly interact with the electrons of the medium. Particles like neutrons, which are neutral, they don't have a charge, or electromagnetic radiation like X-rays or gamma rays, they cannot directly interact with the electrons. So what they do, they first interact, they, they set in motion charged particles. Typically photons, they do it by uh, uh, either a photoelectric effect or a Compton scattering. So they, they set in motion a, a, an electro of the medium. The neutrons, which are much heavier, they have the same mass as the proton, more or less. They preferentially interact with protons. And then the proton, which is a, which, which is a recalling, is the one that we actually interact with the electrons of the medium. So this is the difference between direct and indirect. indirect. I don't know if it's clearer now. Okay, very good. The Brenstallung? As well, so X-ray. So maybe I don't know. Said, do you want to to explain mm -hmm. a bit your question, or is there anything like breaking X-ray? If so, mm -hmm. can you? No, I, I, I think the question is about Bremschwellung. Uh, In general, to to elaborate on the concept yeah. of the Bremschwellung. Yeah. I think it's but no. Uh, after Simon said. Yeah. Um, well, Bremsstrahlung is actually is double S Strahlung. Uh, I tried to write it. Bremsstrahlung. It should be like this, if you see it. Which simply means uh, um, breaking in German. Bremsstrahlung means to. I don't speak German, but as I know, it's the. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the, it's um, it's when a, a, an electron interact with the, um, yeah, it's a breaking exercise. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the German uh, term for breaking. So it's when the electron will interact with the um, uh, electric field of the atom. And then is essentially slow down by um, irradiating uh, X-rays, essentially. Or, or say photons. Yeah. It's actually this, this system which is used in um, medical electron accelerator to produce the, um, the photon field which is used for therapy. Because most of the cancer treatment is done with photons more than electrons. So what you do, the, the accelerator accelerate electrons, if I say to 10 MeV. Now the electrons are sent to a high Z target, typically tungsten, because the, this, this if conversion between electrons and uh, Bremsstrahlung X-rays is more efficient, uh, the heaviest is the target. So if you shoot 10 MeV electrons on a tungsten target or, or a piece of plastic, you produce much more X-ray photons from tungsten than from plastic. 
So what you do in a, in a medical electron limit, you shoot the electron beam onto a, a, a what is called a Bramstown target, which is actually a tungsten target, a tungsten disc. And the electrons are actually um, slow down and brought to rest at a certain point. And while doing this, the interaction with the, um, the, the, the electric field of the atoms um, generates photons. Is, is actually every time, in fact, with the, the charged particles um, uh, slow down, if you like, um, or say, or, or um, change the trajectory, it's, I mean, Christine can be even more precise, it's, it's what happens also in, with the, with the in synchrotron with synchrotron radiation. I mean, uh, in, that, in that case, the electrons are, are following a, a curve, uh, um, you know, they, they change uh, part of their acceleration and they, 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 they uh, throw away part of the energy by, by, by X-rays. It's, it's this, a similar principle, which in a synchrotron, it's a, it's a parasitic, uh, a phenomenon except in synchrotron light source which is done on purpose and it happens also in matter yeah very good uh, then the one may last question so would be why would uh, we have some container made of wood to uh, to get uh, some uh, i mean to protect uh, some uh, radiation source it depends what because the wood is not very dense so i mean one of the um, quantity i mean of the parameters which are important for shielding is uh, density density and composition. So, it so wood is very light, so it can be okay to shield the uh, uh, beta particles. But if you take a cobalt 60 source, I mean, the, 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 the photon will go through. Huh? It, it will not be a, it, it will not be a, a, good, a good shielding at all. Huh? So for photons, you know, for, well, again, if you have a ion 55, which is a 6 kV photon emission, but then you shield it with a very little thing. But if you have uh, cobalt 60 with 1.3 MeV, wood is too light. Okay. For instance, I mean, yeah. a very efficient material to shield neutrons is water. You know, in, in, a, in a nuclear reactor, the, or, you know, or, or, you know, the, the, or, 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 or in a, you know, a facility for storing spent fuel, you put the, you put the, um, the uranium bar in, in, in water because the, the water, you know, absorb neutrons. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not very practical to build a shield made of water, aquarium. But yeah. Water is very efficient because you have lots of hydrogen and of course neutrons interact with hydrogen and slow down. Yeah, lousy. Yeah, very good. So I think that we pass our time. So I guess that if there is any other question, we can keep them for next week. We can still week. ask next week. I mean, well, we can start, you know, with five minutes or 10 minutes question next week. So next week, the lecture is going to be lighter. I, I can anticipate. This was a bit, uh, a, bit, a bit more fundamental. Next, next one is there would be a lot of uh, images also, picture, a little bit of instrumentation, but uh, it's going to be a bit lighter. Okay, very good. So very hope good. you enjoy it. And, um, I think so. We cannot clap, but uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. So we see uh, um, next yeah. week, same time. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marco. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katevi. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Christine. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, Marco, just one thing. I, yep. The lectures are recorded, yep. and I'm going to put the recording back to on to the Indigo agenda page. Okay, it's fine. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Good. Bye. Thank you very Bye. Much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.